from the macabre minds of Laughing Devil Production comes another story from the Nightshade Diary. You know what that means. Check under the bed and make sure no one or nothing is there. Is the closet door securely shut? Then leave your disbelief behind, amp up your imagination, and hang on tight for another ride into terror and mystery. And like all good horror stories, just imagine it's a dark and stormy night. And remember, screaming like a little girl is permitted. The Grey Man of Rutum. This story is prefaced by the following letter to Lord Halifax, dated April 29, 1883. The signature of the correspondent had been cut away. Knowing your fondness for an authenticated ghost story, I send you the enclosed. It was told to the bishop at Hires by Mrs. Brooke, wife of Major Alured de Vere Brooke, Royal Engineers. When we received it, we thought that could any corroboration be obtained, it would be as well. And so the evidence of the nurse. C.E. Page was got, and we have it. Should you wish for it, it is at your service. In the autumn of the year 1879, when my husband was captain and adjutant of the Royal Engineers at Caddam, we were invited to spend a couple of nights with some friends at Rutam, an old place of historic interest about eight miles from Maidstone. We drove over in our own carriage, and the weather being cold and wintry, were glad of the warm bear rugs and robes, which we had bought in Canada a few years previously. We arrived at Rudham House only just in time to dress for dinner, and were immediately shown to our rooms. These were at the extreme end of a long passage up a short flight of stairs in a distant wing of the old house. The bedroom, which was large, was not connected with the dressing room, which was a few paces down the passage. The fire appeared to have been lighted only a few seconds before, and the room struck so cold that I begged my husband to fetch up the robes we had left in the carriage, as I thought we should need them at night. This he did. After dinner, we went to a penny reading at which we had been invited to sing and act and on returning as a number of people had come in to supper dancing was proposed with the result that it was nearly two o'clock before we retired to our bed neither on that night nor on the next one when we again danced until a late hour did we get any rest in spite of the fire and of our furs we were horribly cold and my husband even went so far as to declare that he would never sleep in the room again we attributed this intense cold to damp mattresses and the fact that probably the room had not been used for some time. Neither of us thought that it was due to any supernatural cause. In the following spring, Captain Brooke and I, with our little girl, aged five, were invited to Rutam for a week. My husband was unable to leave his duties but urged me to accept the invitation for myself and for the child, who had been ill and would, we thought, benefit by the change. Accordingly, we went there, taking the nurse with us, but remembering my previous experience, I wrote beforehand to ask that our rooms might be thoroughly warm and the mattresses aired. We arrived at Rutam on a Sunday, intending to stay till the following Saturday. Finding the house allotted to us were the same as those which I had occupied with Captain Brooke. I arranged that the nurse should sleep in the dressing room and the child with me. That evening I sat up very late talking to Lady M and her daughter. I remember that as we passed through the hall on our way to bed, a large old-fashioned clock on the stairs struck one o'clock, and I remarked that it was Sunday morning. The instant I reached my room, I was struck by the vault-like coldness of it and anxiously approached my child to see if she felt it. She appeared to be perfectly warm, 
and was sleeping soundly, but for more than an hour after I had lain down beside her I shivered and shook with cold. At eight o'clock on Sunday morning, the nurse came in with a white face, red eyes, and frightened looks. When I exclaimed at her appearance, she told me she had had a very bad night. Up to one o'clock, someone had been playing practical jokes in the passage, opening her door, laughing outside, and then going away and coming back. Why did you not lock your door? I asked. I did twice, was her reply, but soon afterwards it was opened again. I quite thought that she had been dreaming and rallied her about what she had been eaten for supper. She went to a breakfast, from which she returned looking excited. Oh, ma'am, she said, is it not too bad? These rooms are haunted and the doors can never be kept shut before one o'clock. It appeared that the servants had excited her suspicions by questions as to what sort of night she had had and had then told her she need not be afraid another night as she had only to leave her door open and nothing would happen. I told her that it was very unpleasant, if no more than that, and that I would make inquiries. On the way back from morning church, I questioned Lady M about the house, asking which was the most ancient part and so on, and whether there was a haunted room. A look of intelligence flashed from my hostess to her daughter and back again. The latter then said, Yes, there is a haunted room, but we will not tell you which it is, as you might imagine things. I think I know already, I replied, and my nurse was frightened by the ghost last night. They would vouchsafe no further information on the subject, but offered to let their under-housemaid sleep with a nurse if she were feeling anxious. This I agreed to, and when we were going to bed, I told the girl to leave the door of the room open and to go to sleep without thinking of any foolishness, as of course ghosts did not exist. I undressed and sat down by the fire to analyze my own feelings. I must insist that I was not in the least nervous or uneasy, only rather curious as to what might happen. I made up the fire, locked the door, and took the further precaution of putting a chair under the handle. At first I thought of sitting up to watch, but being tired I at last went to bed and to sleep. I awoke after what had seemed a short time and heard the clock strike twelve. Although I tried to sleep again, I found myself getting colder and colder every moment, and sleep was impossible. I could only lie and wait. Soon I heard steps coming along the passage and up the stairs, and as they slowly approached my door, I felt more and more alarmed. I scolded myself. I even prayed fervently. Then I heard a slight fumbling, as it were, with the handle of the door, which was thrown open quite noiselessly. A pale light, distinct from the firelight, streamed in, and then the figure of a man, clothed in a great suit trimmed with silver and wearing a cockerel hat, walked in and stood by the side of the bed furthest from me, with his face turned away from the window. I lay in mortal terror watching him, but he turned, still with his back to me, went out of the door, uttering a horrid little laugh, and walked some paces down the passage, returning again and again. After that I think I fainted, for it was nearly two o'clock when I became fully conscious again. I did not get up, and still believing that I had had a fearful dream tried to go to sleep. When the maid opened my door in the morning and pushed aside the chair, my belief in the supernatural was not so strong. On the Monday evening I asked the nurse, who by the way had not been disturbed the previous night, to come and sleep on the sofa in my room. I did not tell her what I had seen or thought I had seen and had still enough courage to be anxious to discover whether the events of the night would be repeated. Again on this third night, I awoke to hear the clock strike twelve. I called in a whisper to the nurse and found that she was also awake, and presently we both of us began to have the cold sensation. Presently the nurse said, I hear steps, ma'am. Do you? Yes, I replied. I will get up and meet it, whatever it is. In fact, 
I did try to get up more than once, but in vain. It was as though I was bound to the bed, and this time all my courage left me. Once again the door opened noiselessly, and the great figure made his entry and uttered his diabolical little laugh. The nurse saw and heard all this as plainly as I had done, and also declared that she could not have moved or spoken while it lasted. Next day I told the ladies in the house what had happened, adding that since my nerves could not stand a further trial, we must return home. In vain they assured me that my visitor would not trouble me again that he only appeared three times and always to strangers and never did any harm and much more to that effect i refused to repeat the experiment and by leaving my hostess roof there and then i forfeited her friendship i believe the family has suffered from these visitations for seventy-five years and that the ghost is supposed to be that of a man who murdered his brother in the room in which i slept and threw his body out of the window. I am told that there is in existence a portrait of one of these brothers dressed as I have described him. A copy of the nurse who swept with Mrs. Brooke and her child on that occasion was attached to the story sent to Lord Halifax, and in everything it agreed with the story she had written.